If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more it, It's a spiral. It's, uh, they, they call it the race to the bottom, and there's a reason for it, because it really is a race to cut everyone's wages. Mm -hmm. Hello, and welcome to the Populist Dialogues, a project of the Alliance for Democracy. Our purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a society based on a true democracy. I am your host, David Delk. Our guest today is Madeline Elder, president of the Communication Workers of America Local 7601? 7901. 7901, which is here in Portland. So welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Yeah, great. Good. I've been wanting to have a conversation with you here on the show for a long time, so I'm glad that we're finally doing that. So uh, one of the things that I noticed when uh, you sent me an email confirming was that you have this l logo that says no TPP on, your, on, on, the, on the bottom of, of your signature on your email. So why is this important to you? Well, the TPP is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's it's a very broad, uh, I call it a corporate trade act. They call it a free trade act, but I call it a corporate trade act. It's a very broad one that hits all, all the nations of the Pacific Rim. They can all theoretically join in this trade act. And it's, it's like NAFTA in that it takes over, it, it, prevents sovereignty, it doesn't do anything for workers in any of those countries, and it doesn't protect any of the environment in any of those countries. So you have a situation where the corporations basically have, that's why they call it free, the corporations have free reign for trade, for uh, messing up our environment, for paying workers crap, for allowing workers to work without, uh, without any safety measures. And in exchange, we don't get anything. Mm -hmm. we, lose, we lose our right to pass laws um, that protect the environment or pass laws that strengthen our labor laws and so on. Okay. And, and so if, if one of the countries which is party to a, to a free trade agreement, when we're talking about free trade agreement, we're talking about NAFTA and CAFTA, and like there was just some new uh, agreements that were signed in the last year, one with South Korea, one with Colombia. Um, what's the mechanism that allows uh, corporations to challenge laws? Well, uh, under, under these uh, trade acts, corporations can actually sue a, co a government, sue a country, because that country has restricted their trade through passing laws that would protect workers or would protect the environment or would even just protect the sovereignty of that nation, mm -hmm. their ability to rule themselves mm -hmm. without corporate influence. And so uh, they can sue and those countries can owe uh, billions of dollars to corporations just for the simple act of being a government and doing what governments should be doing which is advocating for the people who live in that country. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I was just reading online that uh, Canada, who is you know, party to the NAFTA as well as some of the other agreements, uh, has some $2 billion worth of claims that could be uh, adjudicated against it, that it could end up owing as a result of these corporate challenges to their laws and regulations. And one of the things about those corporate challenges is it's all theoretical. I, theor I, as a corporation, theoretically am going to lose this much money in profits because you passed this law. It's all theory. It isn't, I was actually hurt by this thing. It is, I theoretically could be hurt by this thing. And that's what's really incredible. I can't go to a court today and say, well, I could theoretically be hurt by you improving the road outside my house. I mean, it's just kind of a ridiculous thing, and yet these free trade agreements, these corporate trade agreements, allow that sort of thing to happen, too. Yeah, that's a really good way of, of framing and thinking about that. I, I hadn't quite thought about that, but, uh, yeah, you and I could not do that. And the other part of that, of course, is that an, Amer you know, an American company could not sue the American government 
for uh, for potentially losing profit f for potentially losing future profits but a company in South Korea for instance uh, could sue the US government for for that or an American company could sue El Salvador which is uh, as well has has certainly happened uh, and uh, uh, yeah so there's uh, all kinds of ramifications for it but it does put uh, foreign companies above domestic companies also. It does. And it also, it also encourages companies to have foreign ca headquarters so that they can then sue the, the country that they originally were part of. Y yes. And just to add to that, the case that comes to mind is a case under CAFTA in which a Canadian company, Pacific Rim Mining, sued El Salvador. Well, the interesting thing was that Canada is not a party to CAFTA, and so in order for them to use the CAFTA um, um, requirements, um, they had to buy a company in the United States, and then that company sued for those lost profits. So uh, an interesting um, it definitely empowers, I mean, you know, at baseline, it really empowers uh, corporations to challenge um, the sovereign ability of, of countries to, to govern themselves. Well, it, it creates a situation where corporations are above the law. They're above the laws of all the governments where they actually may or <laughs> where they actually are or theoretically are. And yet the workers don't have that same right. Mm -hmm. I mean people from Mexico coming to the United States to work it's you know they take their lives in their own hands that they're not allowed to do it unless they have a green card there's these waiting lists there's what 11 million people that really need a path to citizenship because they are working in the United States but cat if they were a corporation there would be no problem and that's what's really unnecessary to me that is totally unnecessary and it creates a situation where you have two classes of workers uh, undocumented and documented the undocumented are used to bust um, organizing drives they're used to lower wages in the general prop population and they don't have any rights so when they get hurt or whatever uh, they don't have any recourse because they're undocumented and so and that reaches then into these trade agreements where, for example, when after NAFTA, I was down in Tijuana, there was a, um, there was a factory that made shipping containers, and it was payday, and we watched the line of workers collecting their checks, and almost every single person was injured, was missing a finger, had, a, had something on their arm, had something on their leg. Seriously, I'm not exaggerating, because they had taken all of the safety equipment off of the, the uh, factory floor because it was faster not to have the safety equipment. Okay. And so you had a situation where these workers, and they had laws in Mexico, but because of, because of NAFTA, the corporations really didn't have to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. uh, right, yeah, and, you, know, you can have all the laws you want if they're not enforced and someone's not looking over a shoulder. Uh, it doesn't matter what the law is. Exactly, right. and so factories that should have been in the United States go down to another country where they don't have the same sort of environmental or, or labor laws or safety and health laws, and so you have a situation where uh, workers' jobs go overseas, mm -hmm. and not just factory jobs. Mm -hmm. We're talking, uh, for example, here in Oregon, T-Mobile had a call center in Redmond. 300 people. They had on-site child care. It was really incredible. CWA's been trying to organize T-Mobile for the past few years. And so T-Mobile said, well, we're going to send these five call centers to the Philippines. And one of them was the Redmond Center. They closed down the Redmond Center. So CWA went to the government and said, all those call centers where the work went overseas, those workers should have Trade Act adjustment funds. And T-Mobile fought CWA and we won. Hmm. 
And so we won that money. It, it, it doesn't make up for the job, though. Uh, yeah, because... It doesn't make up for the job, but corporations won't even recognize the fact mm -hmm. that they are disadvantaging people by sending that work to places where the people make a tenth of what, what we make here in the United States. Right, yeah. And I just saw a study just a few days ago, and I'm going to put this on the Alliance for Democracy website so that other people can see it also, that says that uh, if the Trans-Pacific Partnership is enacted, 90% of all American workers will see a decrease in their wages. Well, when you have one of the partners is Vietnam, where the average wage is $2.28 a day. Mm -hmm. And who can compete with that? The other thing is there's corporations in this company that insist on that sort of uh, wages for what they buy. For example, Walmart. Walmart goes on the system where you want your product sold in a Walmart store, then you give it to us at cost. We're not going to pay for your for your overhead. We're not going to pay for shipping. We're not going to pay for your for your uh, advertising or corporate executives. How much did it cost to make it in this plant? And that's how much we're going to pay you for it. Mm -hmm. And so, of course. U.S. companies aren't going to do it here. They're going to do it someplace where they can make up the money mm -hmm. that they would lose in the United States right. by having it done, having it made in Vietnam mm -hmm. or China or wherever else the lowest wages are. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, as there are fewer and fewer jobs, the, the willingness of people to take a job at a lower wage uh, increases. And also the market, then decrease the market wages decrease. It it's a spiral. It's uh, they they call it the race to the bottom, and there's a reason for it because it really is a race to cut everyone's wages. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, and it's been going on since well before NAFTA, but NAFTA uh, was the first trade agreement that really accelerated that, and we could see that. And, and these agreements since then have done the same thing. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I remember that uh, the agreement that we signed with Jordan at the time was supposed to be a uh, agreement that was very protective of labor standards. And I think that uh, in the meantime, and I'm certainly not any kind of expert on the Jordan agreement, but I think that labor has generally been very disappointed with even that one, which was supposed to be you know the best that labor had gotten. So. Well, well labor has brought suit under NAFTA. Um, CWA had organized a shop, uh, they made jewelry or something in the Southwest, and it was almost all Spanish-speaking people in this plant. We organized them, the plant closed. As soon as people voted for the union, the plant closed and, and went over across the border. And so CWA brought this company, uh, it was a Mexican company, and brought this company uh, uh, under suit under NAFTA but the fact remains the plant went away mm -hmm. it went away they they uh, violated US labor law and it didn't really make any difference actual difference in the lives of the workers unfortunately you know suing it I mean once the horse is out of the barn I guess then you can't really get it bring it back right. it's just really really hard to do mm -hmm. right yeah well we uh, have so far just talked about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We really wanted to talk about, um, or at least uh, I did, uh, was you know, what is your labor union doing? What kind of campaigns are you involved with? Well, we are involved nationally on, the, on opposing the Trans-Pacific Partnership with uh, the Blue-Green Alliance nationally, with um, even locally here with the Sierra Club. We really feel that um, economic sustainability and environmental sustainability have to work hand in hand. There's no way, really, with the dwindling resources and uh, the global warming, CWA really believes that we have to have environmental sustainability in order for economic sustainability to happen. And so we, we are definitely going to Congress. We're using all of our resources in terms of lobbying and so on uh, to oppose fast track now. It's all about fast track now. Um, and uh, we're working with a lot of environmental groups, which brings us to 
uh, discussions on global warming, which we had on the floor of the National Convention in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh -huh. last spring. Uh, very something that I would never have thought would happen 20 years ago, honestly. Uh, yeah, and you know, typically you know, environmentalists are usually placed as in opposition to labor. Uh, what with the Blue Green Alliance, there is this effort to uh, to find common ground. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, there are there are some classic fights that labor has had with environmentalists, which I think really kind of avoids the real point. For example, a few years ago, um, Nestle wanted to to build a plant, a water plant, and buy water in the gorge. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the environmentalists are all up in arms. Number one, you're not going to build anything in the gorge um, because that's you know, it's a na it's, nationally it's, yeah, protected it's, yeah, it's wildlife. A treasure, right. It's a treasure. Uh -huh. And two, that's our water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're going to bottle it and sell, sell it back to us. But then, the especially the trade, building trades are, are, well, that's a lot of jobs to build this plant. We'd really like to build this plant. Mm -hmm. It would mean a lot of jobs for our people. Not that it was guaranteed that it would be built union, but... Probably. It's still jobs, right. It's still jobs. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the building trades, it is based on, you know, we have these jobs for 18 months, and then we have to find other jobs for 18 months and other jobs. It's always, it's always really scrambling to find work. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, uh, that's where those conflicts happened. And we had some major debates on the floor of the, Nash of the state AFL-CIO convention over those issues, the environmental and the moral issue of Nestle itself, a corporation that replaced mother's milk with uh, inferior brands of infant formula in third world countries, all the way up to the present. Uh, so yeah. you, have, <laughs> you have those moral issues as well, plus the community issues of why should our water be sold to these people and then sold back to us? Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the Blue-Green Alliance actually goes back to the, de the fight about the WTO in Seattle. Yes. And that was probably, what, 19... It was 98. 1998, right, yeah. And has the Blue-Green Alliance been in existence or operating yes, over it's this still, period of time? Yes, it's still been operating. You know, the steel workers really, um, from labor, were the ones that really started that, uh -huh. all that. But... A lot of unions have joined it. CWA nationally is part of the Blue Green Alliance. The Blue Green Alliance is coordinated by the state AFL CIO, the State Labor Federation here in Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's still it's still moving on. Yeah, that, 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 that's great. Yeah. So um, w one of the interesting campaigns that uh, CWA here in Portland has been involved with is this creation uh, of a union cab driver. Well, uh, of a union for cab drivers and the creation of an actual new company. Talk about that. Right. Cab drivers nationally are independent contractors. They're not, uh, they're not protected by the National Labor Relations Act. They're independent. In the city of Portland, you must work for a cab company in order to drive a cab, and you have to have a permit and so on. And honestly, in Portland, especially immigrant cab drivers, are treated badly. They pay f up to $560 a week just for the privilege of dr driving a taxi cab. So they have to earn more than that in order to take home any money. Wow. And they pay for all of their insurance, they pay for their gas, they pay for repairs and so on on their cabs if they own their cabs. Um, and if they don't, they pay an extra fee for driving somebody else's cab. Um, and um, they, they, they had no appeal rights. When a cab company said, hey, a customer complained about you, that's a $50 administration fee, i.e. a fine. They, had no, they have no appeal rights. They, they just have to pay it. And in fact, uh, some people, they get their credit card charges from, from the cab company, and there's like $50 gone, and they don't even know why. Oh. You know, and, it, and when they ask, they say, well, a customer complained or whatever. But they don't get to see who it was. They don't get to defend themselves. So uh, in Denver, 
uh, they started a uni union taxi cooperative. It's a worker cooperative. You buy shares. It's it's a real cooperative. You elect your board of directors, and so on. And so uh, cab drivers here in Portland heard about it, and uh, they called the union taxi in Denver. And Denver said, "Well, you know, we organize with CWA. Call the CWA local." And so we started working together. Um, we started working together in November of 2009, and the members of the Union Cab Cooperative worked really hard for three years. They saved their money to build capital. They worked really hard. They talked to the community. They built a business plan that said, we're going to have alternative energy fleet, an entire fleet, by the end of five years if we get this cab company. We're going to have health insurance for us and our families by the end of five years. They have some very... Um, ambitious goals, but I think they're doable. Plus, they cut the kitty. You don't have to pay $560 a week. They vote on what they pay. They vote on where that money goes. They vote on their advertising. They have a say. They have a say. They have appeal rights if there are complaints and so on. It's, it's a whole new era of it's self-empowerment. It's it's not your typical organizing drive. That's what I was just going to say. This is not your typical union effort. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then the other part of it is it, it doesn't say CWA is Communication Workers of America, and you're talking about a cab. So the, so the C has changed from, <laughs> from communication. Well, they to communicate <laughs> with all these. They're sometimes the first person that vers visitors see uh -huh. are the cab drivers mm -hmm. that take them from the airport to wherever they're going. And so they're ambassadors. And our union cab cooperative drivers are very, um, are very aware of that. They're very professional. Mm -hmm. They're proud that they have their own cooperative. And it shows. It really shows. They're very, very persnickety about the condition of their cabs. They uh, take more of an interest in the community itself, in politics and so on. I mean, it's been a real learning uh, experience for me um, because these are people who were um, leaders in their own countries from wh which they immigrated. Mm -hmm. And so this is like, it's one of the most exciting things I've ever done, I think, yeah. I'd say. Yeah, that, that, that's really, really great. And it does seem like, you know, labor needs to uh, move out from their traditional focus. Mm -hmm. uh, this whole idea of, of unions being a business uh, to uh, to uh, increase the the wages only of their members you know, to a larger focus that is that can be perceived by the general community as being a benefit for all of us. Yeah, we want to build a movement. Uh -huh. We really need a movement of people to offset and to get rid of the corporate influence. It's our country. We need to take it back. Yes. Uh, I think that's an excellent uh, statement to, to say thank you very much for being here, Madeline. Thank you, David. Okay. This was fun. This was fun, and we'll do it again. All right. right. Our guest today has been Madeline Elder, President of the Communication Workers of America, Local 7901, mm -hmm. 7901 which is here in Portland. So we want to thank Madeline for being here. Don't forget that you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populist dialogues to view most of our past programs and when you're there don't forget to click on the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded you'll automatically receive an email notification if you are watching on YouTube you can help us expand our viewership contact your local cable access station and see how you can sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program most local stations are looking for good materials and we'll welcome the suggestion. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. We want to thank uh, Roger Bates, Dave King, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for watching. Thank you. And I hope that we'll see you again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, 
Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock. Cause I never heard my money talk. When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I'll believe they're human like me We want to build a movement. We really need a movement of people to offset and to get rid of the corporate influence. It's our country. We need to take it back.